Hi, welcome to tonight's artist lecture. Um, we're very pleased to have Ori Gersh here tonight. Um, Ori's photographs have been exhibited around the world, from London to Basel and Belfast to Tel Aviv. Um, he's got a new show um, with the White Noise series opening at Andrew Mamory Gallery on the 25th of May, and some pictures of Sarajevo are appearing in the current issue of AA Files. Um, tonight he's going to talk about a series of photographic works, all of which emerged from journeys across Europe. Um, the work set up a range of dialogues investigating history, memory, and place. And although many contain clear formal references to the history of painting, um, all rest on profoundly human narratives. So I'd like you all to welcome Ari Gersh. I'm going to start to talk in a kind of um, chronological order. Um, in the beginning of um, the images I'm going to show, um, I feel a bit maybe distance from them now, but I think that they are quite clinical to the way um, my work later developed. So this is, this is one photograph from a series of, um, of images that I've done in 1995, very close to uh, a friend of ours was uh, dying of cancer. And she was living with us for the last uh, few months of her, of her illness. And then uh, after she died, her mom gave me a photograph of her. And then uh, took this photograph to the studio and I put it on the floor. Took a five by four camera, a technical camera with a Polaroid bag. I put the Polaroid, I had one pack of Polaroid. Put the image on the floor and I copied it. And I process the Polaroid and I look at the new image, put this one on the floor and kept on doing it until I ran out of film. And I didn't have a clear rationale to, to, to this action. It was a kind of intuitive response. But something very strange happened, happened to me while I was doing this. When I held the photograph in my hand, then there was a, a gap between my understanding the reality I was living in, and the reality of the image. And it's looking, it's looking at her image, and she was still alive, and she was frozen in a moment that I recognized so clearly, but in my head I knew that she's, and she's dead. And I remember that Ronald Bass was talking about this, about the, the moment in every photograph, he was looking at one photograph um, that was taken by um, uh, Alexander Gardner, of um, a person that uh, just one minute before he was um, Before he, was, before he was he was killed, the person that was then uh, accused for assassination of, um, of Lincoln, and when when he talked about this image, one of the things that um, really uh, disturbed him about it is the notion that every photograph had this um, duality about this has been and this will be. He was looking at an image of a person that is about to be killed, but the reality while looking at the photograph, this person wasn't there anymore. And this gap, this gap was, was really puzzling me, it really disturbed me. And it brought some thought about photography that maybe I lost in the process of doing images. Remember the first time going to the dark room and put black and white paper and start to develop it, an image appeared. This moment is, is kind of a, um, it's like a, it's a mystical moment. It's, a moment of a, of a revelation. After a while working with images, these moments are being forgotten, and images are becoming just, well, I start to work with images almost as a source of information, continuously trying to analyze the, the meaning, the content of the photograph, and lost something so essential for, uh, for every photographic image. This gap, it's almost like a, like a time machine, a preservation of the present. There is almost a, I always feel that there is a denial in us. We always move into what seems to be like a future and leave traces of the past behind us. And photography is standing in opposition to this. It frees the present. Uh, Italia Calvino was talking in, 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 about different notions of time. And one of his possibilities was that time, rather than looking at time as a linear, looking at time as slices. And all these slices, there are presents that are being frozen in them. And we're moving in 
we're moving through them, but at the same time they are always being preserved. And the photograph, at this moment, it seems so clear to me. I mean, I couldn't bridge this gap between the fact that what I knew about one of my closest friends and the reality that the photograph was there and I couldn't deny it. And straight after this, I started to do a series of works that all of them was dealing with the, this idea of um, photographic death, the notion of time in photograph, and also this intense activity of trying to, den trying to deny or trying to preserve moments and try to hold on to them. And the sentimentality that the photograph hold was, a, I think it's a, um, it's probably one of my main attractions to, to photography. Um, and I started, oh, I started together with Tracy, uh, the woman I was living with at the time, a series of images where we were photographing each other every day. They, we, when we talked about it, we thought that we'll do it for the rest of our life. And maybe we did. We're not together anymore, and this work is not a, is kind of a kind of stop. And the idea of these images was, there was nothing heroic about these images. What we did is every day, we just sit in the, I set up in, in our living room a big softbox with a medium format camera and we just sit in front of this camera and take a photograph. There is no, um, no pathos at all. The images, on the contrary, I mean, I was more, we were more interested in the mundanity of the images and the subtlety, how they are um, reflecting, maybe reflecting our personal life but also reflecting our relationship in a way that is um, um, that can only be detected while looking at, at many of these images. And there are thousands of these photographs. We were doing it together for about two and a half or three years. And I continued doing this for about uh, six years. The last few months I kind of stopped and it may continue, it may not. Then the the strange thing about these was that every time we process them, I only have them in contact, and there are books and books full of these images, that every time we look at these images, we were not there. There were always, again, this, this bridge about looking, it's, it's, it was, the feeling was as if we were looking at, I, I felt always as if I'm looking at my own death, as if I'm looking at time that I'm not part of, but this close examination that there is image of every day, and every day of my life can be detected backward, was something that was quite unsettling. But Again, like every experience, I think in life, uh, they tend to trivialize themselves and after a while becoming mechanical. So from the beginning where it was a, it was the whole process of the, of the gap between taking the images and looking at them was a, so unsettling. After a while, it just, I, for me, it became quite mechanical. I'll just do them, contact them, and then start cutting them and putting them into the notebook. These images of traces are not a continuous, say, five or six days. Maybe there is a bit of gap, but they're more like from the same, uh, I don't know, from a period of three weeks or so. This series of images, from, I, I think, was very important because it was the first time, I think, that, photo that my, uh, my photographic work changed. It was no longer, up to that point, I used to be much more didactic and I'll define a concept almost like a project, and I tried to realize it. And I, I felt very uncomfortable with this. It seems that the visual exploration became an illustration of an idea, because the concept was so, rig so rigid, and then the images will try to realize it. I felt that there is a problem there, that there is almost um, disrespect to, uh, to, vi to the visuals, to the metalingual. I was saying, when I was doing my BA, I was in, um, in Arrow College, which is was part of the kind of a Polytechnic Center London, after, under the, uh, the heavy influence of Victor Bergen. And there was so much emphasis on words and talking about images, and almost preempting them to a point where if you can't talk all the way through the image, then the image cannot justify itself. And it's, uh, it's very problematic because I think that the magical, the, the magical quality of, a, of an image, of a, any visual image, is exactly in this point where you can't talk about it. There is something, that, a resonance of the image that is metalingual. And when, we start the, when I started this work, it was the first time that actually we said something quite regimented. We'd take a picture every day. But we became the experiment of our own work. The, 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 the destiny of the work was unclear to us. And 
we just set the rules and allow, so it became like a, an open terrain that anything can happen. And there is another excitement, you know, a sense of danger of this unpredictability. And also the fact that rather than trying to be in total control to allow the world to control, um, to control us. So it's this kind of a duality. And kind of uh, stand with this image. It's, uh, after we separate, and it's kind of going almost a biographical way, but each work it seems to be consequence of some kind of personal event that happened. Um, I felt that, um, that my, partly my grounding in Britain was, uh, uh, became to me uncertain. And also, I felt that I'm still, uh, there is a, a kind of a need to hold on to things. And I decided rather than um, trying to work in a territory that is familiar to me, just uh, to go on a journey. And to go, and it started with shorter journeys. This is the journey to Sarajevo when I was driving from London um, all the way to Sarajevo. I, I've done a few shorter journeys before. And at the time it was, I think, mainly intuitive. But the notion of journey became very important to, um, to, the, to the way I work, to my interest in, in, in working. And there are a few things about, uh, about this journey. I mean, I think that then, then I, I have strong the image of, uh, of Columbus going and discovering America. I know that uh, before, before Columbus already, it was clear that uh, the world is round. But I have this image of uh, pioneer travelers of, uh, traveling in the boats and reaching a point. And if they pass this point, they believe that they may fall because the world may end. But still there is this drive and curiosity to keep on going this notion that there may be something uh, to discover. And this notion of uh, facing the unknown, of the, the uh, it's, it's a mixture of, of sensation and, and curiosity that it bring, was, um, I think, uh, one of my main interests. Because it wasn't just, okay, there is the experience of the external journey of trying to go from one point to another. But I think that within this journey, there is the possibility, there is this, endless scope of possibilities of things that may happen and also the possibility that nothing will happen. And working in, in I think that I feel that working in such an open, in open space and is, and is, very, is very relevant to, to the state I was in. I was, I'm constantly kind of thinking about the, the relationship between the head and the stomach, between the rational behind why doing things and the certain intuitions that cannot be explained. And I think that there, is, there must be a point. I mean, there is points that, uh, and I know, I know this, I'm working now, I teach in college, and there, we put a lot of emphasis of discussing work and trying to understand why, why doing things. And I think that it is important in order to, to grasp and understanding. Um, but there is a point in uh, reaching a point in understanding that I feel that you can allow to let things go, and it's already there, and you don't need to spell it out. It will actually emerge even if you even without trying to, uh, to call the things in name. I think another thing that uh, was very important for me oh, in, in the thought about journey is another book by Talib Khalid, you know, The Invisible City. And I have this image about the, the kind of the, the gap between the physical journey and it, some kind of metaphysical journey. And the relationship between Kabul Khan and, and Marco Polo was something that I found incredibly interesting because it seems that Kabul Khan had this huge empire and can never see all of it. So you need to hire people that will go to all those places and return back and tell him what his empire looked like. And Marco Polo is one of them, but Marco Polo cannot speak the same language. So every time Marco Polo returned at the beginning of the book, he's coming back with object and he's doing those performances and he's humming and he's trying to kind of explain. And he feels very uh, great satisfaction because he managed to, to, to to deliver the spirit of the place without, um, without being too, um, without over articulating or, or illustrating it. But the problem that he starts to have is that after a while, his body language becomes so articulate that he feels that he doesn't do justice to the places. But at this point, he starts to speak the language. So he starts to mix the language with those performances. But after a while, the language becomes so dominant that all left is those very clear articulation of the places. And once again, he feels that uh, he's doing, uh, that it's, 
doing unjust to, to, to the places he visited. And then there is a point in the book that um, Willy Khan said to him, don't describe to me the places you've been, let me describe them to you. And at this point you start to feel that maybe they are not are they really traveling or not? And it ended up by both of them sitting in, si in silence in the room without any words at all, sp smoking opium. And you realize that actually all these journeys are partly physical, but they are actually the two of them not re at any point not really leaving the room. And Italio Calvino writes the whole book about Venice and it's the different facets of the same place. And I think that this is one of the things that, mo that most interesting uh, for me. It's that as I go on those physical journeys, I just boundaries or there is a kind of a purpose to go but the, the, the photographic consequences of, of the experiences that are coming they are um, related to, to the journey itself but also um, I, I feel that are kind of keeping uh, kept se separate it's, it's almost like I mean it's very difficult with photography because photography is all the time relying on the object that is in front of the camera and it's all the time recalling the reflected light from this object. So, I think that in the first journey, this journey to Sarajevo that I show some of the images, it's more apparent and what happened in the second journey, the serious white noise, noise that I'll show later, uh, images in Poland, the images are becoming uh, uh, dematerializing and becoming almost ambience of place, so trying to, um, to fulfill my greatest desire which is a photographic impossibility to photograph here because like I said photographs need light to reflect from an object you can never photograph the, the ambience or, or um, you, need a, you need a material a material object in front of the camera so these images were um, I start I left London um, and it's always a difficulty I'm deciding I decide that I, that I will go and I get all, all um, my camping, my tent, and my sleeping bag, and this, the, the kind of sorted food and books that I need. But there is always a real fear that, uh, that come with it. So ended up not going. So the first night, I, I, my organization for the journey takes so late that it's already five or six o'clock in the evening. And then I said, well, it's impossible to go at five or six in the evening because by the time I'll reach color, it will be too late. So I end up, and it happened every journey, time and again. I end up locking myself in the house, not answering to the phone, and going to sleep really, really early and saying to myself, okay, tomorrow I'll wake up at four in the morning and I'll go. And that's what happened. So I kind of start the journey. And the first 10 days, I hardly take any photograph. And I, I'm not trying to restrict it. And I, I'm not trying to be disciplined about, oh, I have to take photograph or how it's going to work. I'm trying to be very loose. And if there are days or weeks that there are no photography at all, then it's, it's great. And if there are points of intensities and it's good too. So it's, it, it, it kind of shifts and there is a lot of fluctuation, emotional fl fluctuation and also in photography. And as I start to come close to Sarajevo, the architecture starts start to change and there were all these tower blocks that were built that then were part of, um, I suppose, all the Eastern Bloc policy and it's those modernist buildings. <coughs> and I think part of it was ideological, this, because I think the modernist ethos was going very, um, very well with the, with the socialist idea and it was going on all a, a, lot of, a lot of the artists that were associated with the revolution were um, kind of um, key figures in the, in the modernist revolution. But the other reason obviously was the, the fact that this architecture was um, relatively cheap and it was easy to erect a lot of blocks and sort accommodation. And as I was traveling through these places, I, I start to come to these blocks and immediately I was thinking uh, or oh, have this same um, kind of um, a formally thought images of Modrian but also images of uh, Gerhard Richter were coming to my head immediately and because the colors in these places what happened is that um, Sarajevo or Bosnia was under the Ottoman occupation for about 400 years so there are a lot of influence I think, kind of the vividness of colors I think are coming from those influences and I was going through this and they, they look, those flood building with those color charts. And when I thought about modern, I thought about this kind of attempt to put colors together to achieve some um, perfect balance and color harmony. But at the same time, immediately I was thinking about Richter talking about um, the color charts uh, and how the randomality of colors and how um, composition harmony is, is um, emerging in an organic way. 
And both of them are, is a, are like the two sides of the spectrum, because the, the Richter approach is almost coincidental. And that's what happened in this place, because all these pairs, and although they seem to, to have an almost perfect color balance, at the same time, and there is no coordination between the neighbors. People are just putting whatever decoration, and somehow they're creating this uh, complete composition. But the other thing that really, uh, really interests me was there were a lot of marks of damages, but there was a real vividness and a sense of uh, vitality uh, that come with the end of war. And it's very strange because I'm Israeli and I was living through periods of war, but I was never, um, the places I was living here never, never had to, um, um, to re-emerge or re-establish uh, themselves. Most of the time, um, was happening elsewhere. In my head, it was always this kind of feeling of, um, of incredible strength that is pulling at the end. Uh, at the end. And, I, and this came across all the way through my journey. There was no sense of sentimentality, of um, self-pityness. Uh, On the contrary, there was an um, ice in the air, but maybe it was me, um, re real optimism. And, the geranium and the laundry that was hanging, there was a lot of um, signs of renewal. When I started to take these images, I was, um, I was quite conscious to this, and I was also conscious to the fact that although I'm not intending to be a photojournalist or um, a world photographer, there is, dealing with those issues, there is a real, um, a real question about morality. And I feel that there is a real um, ludicrous attitude of, of, of the media and of photography to take a, a very solid stand between some right or wrong. And the blend between them cannot, I don't think that can be separated at all. And so what I decided to do is to, to pull back and actually have almost a, a, as democratic view as I can, where the, the damages or the scars of building will blend with all the vital signs of, of renewal. So, I kind of in my head at the time I was thinking about these subliminal, subliminal, subliminal marks that, subliminal marks, I mean this is one of the most dramatic images that uh, it's not that subliminal, but uh, um, that are becoming like scars and are, now they're embedded into the building. They become an organic part of the building. Th these buildings are not, they, they, they didn't seem like a, um, static concrete blocks, but there seems something that they, the, the time and memory become a strong part of them. That they are almost living organisms that kind of pumping. And there was endless amount of activity in, uh, in Sarajevo when I was there, because the media lost all interest, I think, in, uh, straight after 96 when the real war was over. And after this loss of interest, there was a, still a lot of UN forces and people that were trying kind of to renew the place. So endless amount of activity. The place was buzzing. And the, the, the images that I started to do, I was continuously thinking about, about this relationship. I mean, in this, this photograph is one, is one that the marker are, are nearly disappearing. And it become almost like some, I, I was thinking also, the, almost some kind of constellation where you can navigate through them, and then certain marks, like a, you know, a burning, um, a burning mark beside the white laundry yard, maybe can make some dialogue, but maybe not. And I'm, I'm, more, I'm really interested in the fact that a lot of these details will get lost. And I think that some of these photographs are embedding in them so much, part of it is so much tragedy, and at the same time a viewer can pass through them, and they become like a formalist, um, grid-like, flat photograph and these details or the, the kind of the, 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 the notion that the formalist appearance can can push or, or can almost blind sometimes the viewers or, or elude the viewers and then and disguise the content and the details that are, that are hiding in the images. This whole idea of formalism is 
a word that, not, that should not be used, and particularly not, I think, in, a, in relation to war photography, was really teasing me. I was really interested in actually treating these, um, these buildings almost as a, as, um, almost as color charts, almost as in, a, in the blunt way that Richter was taking his, uh, his uh, um, painted charts and start to kind of cut them and, and make all these green. And I was interested in this because because I feel a real resentment to the way photography often is taking a stand of, of some truth, of some kind of objective truth, of a source of information that cannot be argued with, and the way it's continuously being manip manipulated and presented um, is, is unquestionable. And by kind of denying almost all the content, although it's there and in the detail, it, the details are very important and it was important for me that it will all be registered on the film, but almost deni denying it by putting a, such a, a strong um, grid, grid form, I felt that some of, these, uh, some of these issues, some of these debates maybe can come, in, can come forward or maybe even create in a, in a very subtle way some kind of provocation. This is a photograph that I was taking in the outside state in Sarajevo. On the, uh, all along the journey, I stay in the tent and in the sleeping bag. And this, the journey is a, is a real journey. It's, I mean, I'm kind of putting myself in a situation of, of solitude for about a month. I hardly speak to anyone. I don't see, I see other people sometimes in the, obviously in the in a campsite, but I'm on my own. And there is a build up create a lot of, uh, a lot of <coughs> intensity. The, um, the book that I was reading while I was traveling to Sarajevo was uh, The Tin Drum. And uh, I started to develop a real uh, affection and kind of a, um, a f affection to Oscar and even a kind of a, a strong association with Oscar, the little boy from, uh, from The Tin Drum. He was, um, Oscar is a, is a midget at the age of three, decided that he will not grow and then caused himself an accident. Society sees him as a victim, but he continuously sees himself as somebody in, in control. Uh, he chose not to grow. He chose to stay an eternal three-year-old child. But the fact that he is a midget um, in, during the Third Reich in Germany, he is a nobody. He is a transparent character. And that, this kind of position allowing him to become almost the consciousness of German society. He can, afford, he can, he can be in a situation where no one will deny him or ask him to leave. And so he's, he's this kind of um, open eyes, but at the same time continuously invisible. And his account of, uh, of Germany from a position of, uh, of an outcast is something that, I don't know, maybe it's to do with the fact that I, because I don't speak to anyone, and this character is so intensely building in my head that I kind of, when I go to Sarajevo, I felt very much like this. I found myself in the middle of an ethnic conflict, which I'm so familiar with as being Israeli but not belonging to it at all. I was able to flow between all these situations. I was able to, um, to be this it's a, it's kind of a classic photo photographer position where um, no one, no one um, is, I'm not taking any side. I'm almost not there. I'm just a kind of a, a, an observer. And so when I got to Sarajevo, I couldn't stay in the tent any longer. Everything. Every, all the open spaces there are, are minefields and there was a strong advice not to go from any road unless you see other people walking on it. And so even the, the houses that I showed you just a few minutes ago, the front of them can be, can be a water minefield. I'll show you a few in, in a second. And I mean, it was so extreme that they, this guy that I stayed with told me that every time he go, every day go to work, he, he was going um, to catch a bus and there was this same um, little island of grass and there was a gardener there that was more uh, more in the grass and he will mow part of it but leave the other one at the other side to grow wild and, and he, one day he asked him why and he said because I saw a mine in this point so it became a mark and he won't cross this point any longer. So people learn to live this kind of a almost symbiotic existence with, uh, with this reality. <coughs> so when I came to this house, um, this, this guy that I stayed with, he's, um, he was a doctor for physics that um, was representing a pharmaceutical company that the center was in Serbia. And then um, he was uh, representing also in Bosnia. When the war started, he lost his job. And since then, 
he, he, was, um, he was unemployed and they started to um, um, rent rooms in the flat. And he took me through the, the house and when I saw this uh, room with the library, I asked if I can stay in this room. And, um, and he agreed. And I asked him if this room got any damages from the wall. And the door, the door was on this side of the, of the room. In the door, there were some captions of bullets that were actually stuck still in it. And he told me that on the first week of the war, a grenade hit the window that was on this side, and ricocheted flew and let me try this laser beam thinking. Do I need to press something? Yeah. Here. So this uh, end grenade hit, uh, hit the window and ricocheted flew and they were cutting through the encyclopedia. This is the only mark. And it's very strange because it seems that this library is so, uh, is so informed and so dense. But at the same time, it's static. It didn't, I don't think that it's in the same order that it was in 1992 when they say grenade it. Again, in this library, I feel that, they, that there is this kind of regimented grid format. And it's a, with the buildings. And I think that this was um, with the buildings that they are so much dealing with the exterior of the city, then this library, is, I think, is standing as a, a pinnacle image that is that repre almost representing culture, representing something that is a, a lot more intimate, that is happening side by side with those um, atrocities. Again, this photograph, I mean, in Sarajevo, also in the change that I start to interact a lot more with people because uh, the city is a lot more dense. It's a photograph that uh, I took from a balcony of somebody that I, that I met when I was in those blocks. And then, um, again, we're sitting on his balcony, he was telling me some um, stories that he, he somehow got involved in the war. He was a um, before, before there was a Muslim army, before the, the actual, because uh, the Muslims didn't get any support or recognition, they formed local police, but it wasn't real police, it was more like a small um, mafia, mafia groups that were um, ruling uh, small territories, and they would have blockades on the roads, and they would stop people, and if they saw cars that they liked, they would point a gun and take from people the gun. Sometimes they throw people out of the houses, he told me that one day he went to um, he went to pick his car from the, the car park down there. He had the goals that he bought in Germany, and they, four people were hanging around the car and they had guns and they asked him to pass the keys and he refused. So fight start and he got shot and he got involved in a struggle with them and presumably he, he killed one of them. He got unconscious and he woke up in the woke up in the hospital. He was in hospital for nearly nearly a month and. He had four bullets in his thigh, so the thigh was completely, um, completely damaged. And when, while he was in hospital, he heard the, one day talks that um, he's um, requested for, for murder. So he was forced to run while he was still injured, run away from the hospital. And he came to his flat, and they already been to his flat, and the flat was in a complete mess. And he was a photographer, and all his photographs were thrown out. It was in the winter, so he found images out in the snow and the house was completely broken. When I came to his house, he showed me this and he, he had these planches and he took the <coughs> draw out. And I've never seen negatives and images in such deterioration. When they had a, a real beauty is that they that probably can, can never be achieved. You really feel that the climate and the time left marks such how the images themselves weren't great, but the, but the, the confrontations that they had with, with the war gave them a very special quality. And anyway, so we were sitting on his balcony and I was just doing this same um, long exposures from, from his balcony. And what I was interested in here is that sometimes this kind of relationship between uh, where life starts and where life stops were in the detail. And in these images it's become obviously the emanating light is representing light and where uh, there is no light. And, there are no lights, but also the way it's, again, these grids are were creating themselves everywhere, where you have this vertical line of this building, and then these horizontal, halfway through the building where the lights stop, kind of uh, working themselves out in the colors, in the architecture, and, and somehow in, in the mass that we're in. 
This is an old people's home that uh, was built just before the war started. And then uh, no one ever lived there. The moment they finished building it, the war started, and this became a front line between the Serbs and the Muslims. So all the grass in front of here was minefields here. It's very peculiar, those minefields, because it's just a yellow ribbon, and it's in the height of a meter, so a kid can just walk under, and it, it happened, it used to happen when I was there, and frequently, the kids will play, and somebody will just walk through, and there will be some the town. This is a gravestone in the cemetery of Sarajevo. It's a very strange, it's kind of, it says it's kind of Jeff Koons for the story. And the other side of things there was that some of, a lot of the images, and I only find this later, a lot of the images, there is hardly any, there, there are traces of light and of people, but there are, uh, but people are, are not really appearing in them. And then in other images, there is this incredible density and intensity of crowds gathering together. And this gathering, this is Saturday morning, I was walking up there on the cemetery, and all of a sudden I saw this line of people walking, and walked to the edge of it, and I saw this swimming pool. People are not in the water, just all around it. And the intensity was, it was happening very quickly, this gathering, and then people will leave the place without a trace within a matter of hours. It happened in this image, and it also happened in, a, in this photograph. It was a performance in the street. I took it from the room where I was staying in. Again, there was, this was the night I arrived there. There was this performance, and all of a sudden the streets were gathering, and as if it's a, maybe there is an edge, an erotic edge to this, of needing to be so, a, so close together, or, or, or I don't, I don't know why, but it just seems to me very clear that these things were, um, were reoccurring. And then I continued the journey down from Sarajevo and I went down to uh, Mostar, which um, was one of the major cities of conflict. And then um, Mostar is a, is a city, it's in a valley, and it's surrounded by those mountains that are completely bare. So the heat is building up there because the, uh, the rays of the sun are reflecting into the middle of this valley. And the temperatures were, I think, over 40 Celsius. I was sitting there, I think I got dehydrating as well. I, I, I ran out of film, I had my last film in the camera and I thought I wanted to wait out when it gets really dark and to climb on one of the mountains to take a, an image of the city. And I was sitting in front of this place. And again, I don't know, a lot of these images are always, all the time coming with some references. And films of Tarkovsky were coming to my mind when I was sitting in front of this, of this place. And some kind of an architectural facade that almost there is no, um, has no volume to it. This is a, an hotel that is, it's a, it's a river bank. I can, I'm showing the next image, the river itself, which seems very idyllic and pastoralic. But actually, the hotel is just um, maybe about 200 yards to the point where I took this photograph. And it's impossible to sit on the riverbank because it's all glass and rusted nails. I went to sit in a, in, in a river. I was waiting for, uh, for darkness to come. But it was, it was impossible. And again, it's, uh, it's really I'm so fascinated by the way life are continuing. And there is something so, um, a certain, a certain calmness and uh, almost like a immediately adaptation to the to new reality and, and this kind of force that is, that is continuing and pulling through. This image was taken at the beginning of the journey when um, I was coming from the Austrian border and I, the first place I passed through was uh, Slovenia and I was, start, I, I was going more and more south. And it's a place that there was no war there at all and there is a real separation because the, Slovenia was under the Austrian-Hungarian occupation for about a thousand years. And actually, the, I think the last four or five years, the first time that uh, this country become, became independent, and much more associated with the, with the Northern European culture. There was no war there, and the traces, the kind of, the certain um, idyllic quality of the place were um, 
were deteriorating, that I was coming more and more south. And the, the, clearest, it, the clearest it was to me is that every time I pass a border, because the Slovenian border, you come and you have about um, eight lanes on each side, and you have all this insurance company and kind of a, a real tourism, um, gear to tourism. And then I went through Croatia, and it became a, a much narrower border. But when I reached uh, Bosnia, it was incredible because the road stopped. And then there was this kind of um, unpaved lane, and I went on top, uh, I started to ride over it, and I saw some people, I tried to ask them, where is the border? And they said, oh, keep on going. And I reached the end of this um, uh, unpaved road, and it was just a river. And by the river was standing, there was one woman with some chickens and a, a guy with a bicycle, and I was standing beside them in this um, kind of uh, run-down, Ferry, tiny ferry, came over. My car was nearly the size of the ferry. Took me to the other side, and this was the um, the border. And I think that, and it was very strange because I, I had this image of Yugoslavia under Tito. There was something uh, um, holistic about the place, and which never was. And actually, the, and the experiences, and I think also the, the images that are reflecting these places are, um, are echoing it. Um, Clearly. Okay. Now I'll talk, uh, talk quickly about uh, this. Uh, this is a new series of images that uh, called White Noise. This is the work that I'm going to show uh, in, in the series that I'm memory gallery. And this is a journey that I've done last year. And it started from uh, Auschwitz and went to Belzec. So it's in Poland and it's more or less from the Czech border to in the Ukraine border. And then um, I wanted to go, I wanted to go to Poland. I think part of it is, a, oh, I didn't want to go to Poland for many years, but I was also attracted and it's part of it to do with my personal history. And just before I went, and I didn't know what I'm gonna do there, but just before I went, I met with a curator called Val Williams and we were speaking and she mentioned a book by Martin Gilbert called The Holocaust Journey. And it's a journey that he did with a group of his students. They started to meet from Berlin, and they traveled through all Eastern Europe. And through this journey, they're doing, each, each of the students was uh, responsible on, on part of the journey. They collected the archival material, and they're doing readings. And the, the tracing places, it's all written like a, like a diary, like a, a journey diary. The tracing places, and sometimes they're very negligible places. It could be just a tree, or it could be just a house that is that nearly demolished now. And they, um, in those places, they retrieve or read some uh, first-hand sources about events that happened there. And I took this book and I started to, to use it as a guideline for the points that I'm going to travel through. To go there, I mean, one of the things that I, that I was uh, thinking while I was going is, or that interests me in going to a place like this is the photographic impossibility. And I, I was thinking, you know, it's, I knew that, they, that particularly being brought up in Israel and having so much pathos to this whole event and being pumped up with it all, uh, all our life, there is, as a, as a child and teenager, I had a certain resentment to it. But also, I kind of, I felt that every photograph of a place like this cannot avoid the, um, the, the cliche. And how can an image retrieval stand um, with, with such a background of, uh, of experience and, and history. And so one of the things I, w I was interested in is how I'm going to face this, in this photographic impossibility. And while I, was, uh, while I was traveling through there, I was uh, starting to take photographs that it was less and less about the places, but more about the ambience of them. I was thinking, in my head, I had the, the painting of Malevich, of black canvases. And I was thinking in photography that it's almost, um, which is kind of the end of possibilities of painting. I was thinking that in photography, to go the other way, a white paper with no information at all on it, it's almost the, um, the, the kind of the collapse of the end of possibility, possibility of photograph. And I was going there in the winter, but not because of this reason. The re I always have an image of Poland, and I think it came probably from talking from my grandmother's story. It's um, of the place, 
place that is very gray and incredibly heavy, and I felt that there would be a huge cloud that will force me to, to walk, to, to bend over while I'm walking and can never stand up. And I felt that to kind of a, to, to experience my, 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 my imagination, the time will have to be in around December. And then obviously there was the snow, so the images, so, so this kind of white monochroma emerged through the, uh, the circumstances of, um, of the journey. And this series of images, they are photographs that I was taking on the train journey from uh, Krakow to, to Auschwitz, to Birkenau, to the camp. And I didn't plan to do this, but when I was on the train, all of a sudden it, it occurred to me that it's exactly the same tracks that took the people from the ghetto to the camp. And the, the difference is that I'm in passenger's train rather than in a careful train, so obviously I had the vista and the windows that I was able to see. And when I was traveling through, I was constantly thinking about, I'm passing in exactly the same route, and, but in a different time, and it's a different space. But there are a lot of evidence, of concrete evidence, to things that were there 60 years ago. And I was, I was attempting to photograph these silence witnesses, thinking all the time about trees that are holding this memory but in complete silence and there is no way to kind of take this memory to squeeze it out and but, it, but it's retaining them. So this idea maybe it's a little bit trivial and I think that um, in a way I'm lucky that it didn't come through. What happened is that I was holding the camera, I was working with a medium format camera, waist level, so I was holding it in 90 degrees to the window and I was trying to photograph all these concrete things like trees or houses that stood by. But because the camera is in 90 degrees, I couldn't predict what is about to come. I didn't have the, the ability, like looking through a window, to look in an angle and to see what is, what is coming ahead and then to anticipate. Things were passing so quick. So every time I see an object that I want to photograph or, or a house that I want to photograph, by the time I press the shutter, it was already gone. So the whole journey was a journey of frustration, of missing what I'm trying to catch. And never, it was kind of, passing by, so I was running one film after another, I was trying to, I get, I felt this aggravation within me. And when I came to, back to London, I started to process them, I felt that I was really um, lucky, though there was kind of a, um, again, the, by abandoning the concrete um, idea or desire that I have, image, much more interesting, I feel that much more interesting images emerge. And it's these photographs that are, they are about me missing, but at the same time I feel that they, they are getting a bit closer to this idea of photographing air or photographing just an ambience of a place without describing it. And that's what I said at the beginning, that maybe it's images that are getting further and further away from the, um, from the, um, from the, the, kind of the deep need of photography to, to hold on to, uh, to object, to capture reflected light. The, and also this kind of the difficulties that they had with the notion of a journey and our photograph, in the, the photographic interpretation of a journey. I'll show you some things. In some of them, the images, what I was doing as well, because I didn't have a clue what I was doing, I was changing the shutter speed all the time. So there are different images where sometimes they, are, they become more figurative and sometimes they kind of fall apart and nearly disappear. And one of the, and the things that's interesting for me as well that happened in these images that I found later, it's difficult to see it on the slide, but you see all these lines. A photograph, one of my frustrations with photographs is that it has no surface. It's kind of Flatness. I always jealous in painting that you can the tactility that is coming with with the object in the process of working. And somehow, and again, I don't know exactly how it happened. I was just lucky. I had these images, like in here. They they have these creases. They're not creases. The surface is actually completely flat. But when you look at them, I just uh, I saw them in larger scale because I, I just did a show in Israel uh, about three weeks ago. There is a, there is a sense of a surface, and there is a kind of a certain illu a photographic illusion that is on, I feel that it's a, a real tease to what a photograph cannot do. And somehow it's occurred, and for me, I, I think it's a, it's, for me it's an interesting addition to how these images are working. 
the fact that it's nearly a quality. It, it, it almost feels like oh, there is a certain need almost to touch the image, to have a, a, a certain physical, um, um, some kind of physical relationship. The process of photography is a, a real frustration because, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. The process of photography is a real difficulty because of this distance between the fact that it's a mechanical record, I mean, it has a, a lot of beauty to the fact that it's a mechanical recording, but also in, in processes that are very emotional, sometimes I feel that it's a, a bring with it certain dissatisfaction. And this is, maybe this is closer to some of the images that I had in mind, and, and probably, I'm not sure if in the exhibition this image will appear, it's maybe, but it's grounding maybe too much the, um, the feeling that the other images may suggest. More images from the train. I, a lot of the images, the, in the process of taking the photograph, I'm always working in a very simple way. I never change the lens, I have one lens in the camera, and I never use any filters, and I use the same film all the time. And because I see, I'm c much more interested in the idea of, the, of perception, of how a space is transformed, not through a lot of kind of technical adjustment, but through um, an interaction between the place, the eye, and, and the camera. And some, somehow, in the, in the most simple, just in a click, something is happening. Obviously, it's never just a click, but uh, I'm trying to simplify the process to this. What tends to happen is that later in the dark room, um, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm starting to relive those experiences. <coughs> So this image is from the train journey, and it's a very dark and heavy image. The other one are printed very light. And obviously I was thinking in the light ones about the disappearance of the image. And this is much closer to images that have in a place that I've never been, and I'm about to go to the Black Forest uh, in, in Germany, and some of the heavy mythology, the kind of relation to German um, romanticism that is there. So, it's a, it's a strange thing to say that they, the image is just a click or they feel that the, da the dark room has become a real mean. And maybe also the dark room is the place where I, I feel that, they, they, that there, is, there is a certain transformation. Mean, I feel a kind of a certain, a, a, yeah. or maybe just in my head, it's an image that is much closer to the process of painting when I'm in the dark room. I never write the color filtration. I never um, I try to be too systematic of how I achieve the images. What I do is I take a box of paper and I start to print. And I, I go through so many paper on, on, each, a, on each image um, until I eat something or until I get bored with the image. So sometimes I can go through 20 pieces of paper really, really quick. And sometimes I, I realize the images that I work a week later. And I, I like, I think that this kind of spontaneity, it's almost like you throw the papers in, you do things, and you're losing control, but within this, developing or trying to realize or develop certain sensibilities and allow the images to kind of um, hold on. So uh, I heard that it's 8 o'clock, so I'm going to be very, very quick now. And this image that is off the train, and it's already in there now, and it's footprint, it's difficult to see on the print, it's much clearer, but I don't know if you can see the, this later. The footprint. For me, it's one of the images that are coming closer to this idea of the white monochrome. It's a point that the photograph nearly collapsed. And it's one of the things that, I in, that I'm really interested in photography, is to erase information to a point where it's almost not a photograph anymore. But just to retain enough for, to justify the notion of this has been. You know, this image is nearly abstract. If I said that it was taken in Birkenau, all of a sudden get a lot of weight to it. But it's the, the notion in the view that where the image was, or the the history that is coming with the image. But the photograph itself, hardly heavy. But it's still, if it was a painting of the same event, it, the experience would be very different. Because the notion of interpretation um, would be very strong. In a photograph, the fact that it's a mechanical recording, the, the fact that I have been in this particular place, um, 
it gives it a certain authenticity and it's part of the photographic line. It's similar to what I was saying earlier about the images of Sarajevo, the fact that I was trying to deal with formalism and almost to deny the fact that the photograph is really with all the pathos about morality and about some kind of truth. So it's about this tension and, and I think that it's a... Um, I'll show you when we move forward quickly. I'm thinking... Okay, I'll, I'll because I, I have a few other images that are very much about this erasing of information after a point that the image disappears. Maybe I'll pass over these. I'll just show them. And I'll go... I'll pass over these. I'll go to this quickly, just like three minutes on this and then finish it. It's, um, these images, because I'm just talking about the raising of information or kind of nearly um, taking the image to a point that it's nearly um, collapsing on itself. These photographs were taken in London. I was living in a council block for, in the 14th floor in Vauxhall. And I started to take these images. I mean, at the beginning, it just, it was so beautiful because I had one window in my living room that was or one wall in my living room that was entirely window. And just to see London at night like this was um, um, so exciting that they start taking photographs, but they were terrible photos, well, there were a lot of cliches. And then I start to see that the plane going on there on the way to Etros, I start to photograph them, and again, and the images never stood, and the clouds, I mean, all the trivialities. And slowly these images say, start to, be, to, uh, to lose more and more detail and ended up those nearly monochromatic images. And I kind of, I see them as documentary of London, but rather, again, w rather than describing the city, it's the ambience, it's almost like a part of the city that it's essential, or maybe 50% of the city, but a part that we are not, not tending to engage with. And all these photographs, once again, it's the same camera of the images from Poland and the same lens, it's just, they, I didn't use filters with them, but I was counting on certain changes, very changes that they cause for the colors to shift so much. Then, and they were taking over two and a half years. So some of them in the spring and some of them in the winter. And once again, it's like, I mean, the line of the horizon, I think is very significant. If I take just this little bit, then it's not a photograph anymore. Well, it is, but it cannot justify its, uh, its existence as the image. And the, the notion, the, the authentic quality of a photographic image is lost. And I think that this is one of the things that really interests me in the images in Poland and really interests me here is what is the point? Just to push it to a point where it cannot, cannot take it any longer, but it's still there. And this is a canary wharf here at the moment. And you can see some of the scratches of the plane. This is city airport and up there it's saying Places that are going to eat through. And the colors are changing as well according to the length of the exposure. So, and you can see the length of the exposure, you can see by sometimes the line of the plane. And the aperture, how much it's open, is the thickness of the line. Because the plane will move in the same, the same speed. So if I'm on 2.8, then it's a thick line. And if I'm F16, it's a very thin line. This is F11, probably. This is one morning from this flat where it was in a real curtain of a uh, I got into the living room and I just saw a grey wall in front of me. And again, I mean, here, losing the bottom is not, uh, is not an issue because I think that the sun is retaining this kind of a uh, photographic, it's just the, the detail that is still holding the, the photographic integrity of the image. It's amazing, I was in a flood that I was able to see sunrises in London. For like the first two years I used to wake up when the sunrise sits on my bed, look out, and if there was a good one, I'd go and sit for an hour until I have to go to work. And again, here it's, it's almost like a wall, the red is creating it. Because some of these images, when you see them, I don't know if it comes in the slide, they are, they are nearly monochrome, and they're nearly flat, but there is a sense of space, of a three-dimensional space in them. In this photograph, it was a um, killer that the red created, it's so flat that as if it's a brick wall that, you know, running through the window, you don't fall down, you just crash and fall back into the room. Okay, that's it. And, and uh, I'm going to go to this and just... Uh,
there, we have no time, no? We have to finish it. I'll just uh, show this uh, last image. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but uh, maybe I'll leave it if uh, Mark suggested earlier that maybe people want to ask a question about it, so I'll give you the opportunity. Um, this is an image that I've done in, um, it's an exhibition at the Chisenel Gallery, and it's a photograph that I take, I won't go in detail into it, just the totality, it's in Wembley Stadium. I'll do it focus this. Um, it's in Wembley, it's in Wembley Stadium, and it was done with the cameras that were taking 360 degrees, <coughs> and I went to the center spot of the pitch. This is, um, now they're not destroying Wembley, but they, uh, I was about to do it, it was supposed to be the game before last uh, ever in Wembley. And um, so again, it's a kind of this historical way that come to the image, although it's only um, a backup to what I was really interested, which is much more to do with the language of photography. And I put the camera on the center spot, and this is during the national anthem, so you can see the English team and the Brazilian team. And the stadium is full with 75,000 supporters. And I sit under the camera, and the camera on the motto turn all around, so it gives an image of the ovalic shape of Wembley, it opened it into one street. And we printed it 18 meter long by two and a half meter high. And then what interests me here, and it, it's opposite of the images from Poland or the sky one, they're much closer to the images of Sarajevo. It's photography is so obsessed and preoccupied with detail. And I thought, okay, in Wembley there are gonna be 75,000 people at one go. And they're all set actually around the center spot so I can can make a portrait of them without any effort. I just need to place the camera, and they're already there around. And I wanted to see if, if the camera had the ability to deal with so much detail. I wanted, I mean, inside I was hoping that uh, maybe there will be a point where the camera will collapse on itself, that it can't hold on any longer, that it's too much for it, which actually happened in the exhibition and was a bit of a disappointment for me, because when I printed it, I, I hope that maybe to keep the thing, just the point before it collapsed. And, and it worked well as a large image, but I think that the crowds themselves, where I hope that you can actually um, separate individual faces in the crowd, they, they start to disintegrate. I mean, you can still be able to see all the body language and what was going on there, but it didn't have the clarity that, um, uh, that I hoped for. But I think that uh, in this respect, these two extremes of um, how much detail a photograph can hold or wants to hold, and to push it to a point where it nearly cannot deal with it anymore. And the other side of erasing information for the image from the, to the point that it's nearly um, collapsing as a photographic image, those two extremes. Things that, in terms of uh, formal language, these are the two things that I'm, I'm, I'm most um, relevant to my practice at the moment. Anyway, I'll stop here. And is there a time for questions at all, or just leave questions? Okay, so if you want to ask any questions, in a answer. Impossible almost to answer because I don't know anything in my life if I look for it or it's come to me. You know, I mean, the, uh, every, every decision that I took in my life, and, you know, I, I live in Britain, I came here on holiday in 1988, and I live here now for the last 13 years. And I took this decision to live here, but the decision took me as well. I, I don't know, I kind of walked there, I was taking other photographs, I was triggered by this. So probably when I saw those clear grid, because you know, when I was traveling through the countryside, they didn't exist. And most of these images happened in a particular time of the journey. So I was attracted to them, and I, probably I was looking for them, but I didn't anticipate them. I didn't really know what Sarajevo would look like. I have some images from my childhood as a Bosnia Sarajevo, the basketball team that uh, was coming to play in Israel from time to time. It was a very, very big idea. So, it's, I think it's a mixture of the two. They come, they come to me and I probably look for them and, and force them on the images.
day, you know, when I started to talk and I showed the image of Teresa, a friend who died, and then when I, the images that I've done, me and Tracy did of each other, there was a point that, um, it's kind of, when I talk about the mystical quality of photography, I was coming, the notion of memory and time in photograph, it's something, I think it's, a, it's, it's my main motivation, and the fact that there are historical journeys, but happening in different time and almost different spaces, and all this idea of, of the memory of the inner landscape, the way it's embedded in it, but not in a descriptive way. And somehow, it's in the air, it's there. I was walking there, and the snow was falling on me when I was in Birkenau. And I was walking, and it was so beautiful. And I was thinking about people in the prisons years ago, walking with those striped pajamas and the wooden clothes in this weather. And, you know, it's almost a, it's a certain identification, but I wasn't there at all. And the strange thing, I came to Israel, and I talked to a friend of mine. His father was in Auschwitz as a prisoner. And his father was talking to him a lot about the beauty of the place and the, the paradox of this. He was talking about the uniforms, he was talking about the, um, the landscape because it's in a very open space. And I think that, so it's definitely the, the memory in the landscape, but it's not, in, um, not a concrete memory, it's almost a, an eternal memory. You know, this snow that was, when the snow was falling, and I started to think about these images. I think that it's, it's a certain continuity that is, the landscape is always there and it's always the same and there are certain human experiences that are being um, accumulated in it or, or marked in it, the same way that is in the building in a way. Vain, exactly. I understand when you talk about the erasure. The Well, it's a, I was uh, meeting with, uh, I'm about to do a show in Israel, I was meeting with the curator and we looked at the images and he was, he was talking about this and, and I wasn't aware to it that even in the images of Sarajevo, in all the images there are they're almost like screens are blocked, although there is an endless amount of details and not really allowing a real en entrance, the creating, and the same the images in Poland with this erased, in, erasure of information, again you get these, these screens and I think that, I think that it, it does it and that it's, they're almost like, and I just wrote a, a, in my diary the other day about a, a screen, a, I wrote it in Hebrew, so I can struggle to translate it, but a, about this kind of a, a just, I just use these two words of erasing and screen as a, probably is a kind of quite important formal motif that is part of the work. I really um, I agree with you. I don't think about it, but it seems that it's, it, it keep, it's reoccurring.
remind you that um, there's an evening of experimental music upstairs starting in about an hour or so. Um, and you're all encouraged to go up to the bar and get drunk enough to listen to it.